Hello everyone. Today's video is actually also my term project for a class I've been taking this summer called Psychological Effects of the Internet. So if you could leave a like down below to help me get an A, I'd really appreciate it. In this video, we will be discussing how the internet is changing our judgment and decision making. In my class, we actually learned that decision making on the internet is not all that different from decision making in real life, but we're going to investigate that a little further. Let's begin by talking about three basic judgment and decision making heuristics I learned about in my class that have been popularized by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Heuristics are cognitive shortcuts we use to make sense of the world around us. The first heuristic we'll talk about is the representativeness heuristic. The representativeness heuristic is when people ignore objective base rates in favor of their own biased information about what is representative. I feel like this is better explained in an example. Let's say I tell you that there is a town where 90% of the population are truck drivers and 10% of the population are professors. I then read descriptions of each person in the town and you have to tell me whether they are a truck driver or professor. Like, Hank has long hair, likes to hunt, and often wears his favorite flannel jacket. Or, Francis carries a laser pointer, is not very athletic, and likes classical music. Or, William goes to the opera, spends a lot of time on the computer, and has visited 28 countries, and so on. It turns out that people tend to ignore base rates, like when I told you that 10% of the population are professors and 90% are truck drivers, and use their own internal representation of professors and truck drivers to guide their decisions of whether a description describes one or the other. So if I read all the descriptions to you, you'd probably guess that half were truck drivers and half were professors because we associate truck drivers with certain stereotypes like that they like to hunt and wear flannel jackets, and we associate professors with certain stereotypes like that they are not very athletic and go to the opera. This can be seen on the internet with online reviews. Sometimes we assume something that has a 5 star rating is better than something that has a 3.5 star rating because we ignore that the product that has a 5 star rating has one review and that the product that has a 3.5 star rating has a thousand reviews. Base rates are important, but sometimes our internal representations of the world get in the way. The next heuristic I'd like to talk about is the availability heuristic, which is when prominent ideas in our minds are easier to recall than non-prominent ideas. For example, Bart Everson and Elliot Hammer did a study where they gave an article about someone being attacked by a shark to half their participants and an article about someone winning the lottery to the other half of their participants. They found that the participants who were given the shark article tended to overestimate the probability of them getting attacked by sharks in the future and underestimate the probability of them winning the lottery in the future while the participants who were given the lottery article did the opposite. The participants used the information in their mind that was most prominent to them, and based their judgment on that. This can be seen online with photos on Facebook. The Lollapalooza Music Festival just happened this last weekend in Chicago, and I saw so many photos on my newsfeed about it. This caused me to overestimate how many of my friends actually went to it. So, next time you feel lonely because you think everyone is having fun, keep in mind that Facebook is going to give you an inaccurate representation of how much you're missing out on. The last heuristic I'd like to talk about is the anchoring and adjustment heuristic. This bias is better explained than described. Suppose I tell you that on average, people have about 150,000 hairs on their head. Now I ask you how many hairs you have on your head. You'd probably think around 150,000, right? Because you're anchored to the number 150,000. Suppose I tell you that, on average, people have about 60,000 hairs on their head. Now you'd probably think you'd have around 60,000 hairs on your head. Anchoring and adjustment is all about finding a reference point and adjusting predictions based on that reference point. Makes sense, right? You're using the information at your disposal to come to a conclusion. Now, suppose you're online and looking to buy a magazine. The first option is one year online access for $60. The second option is one year print access for $125. And the third option is one year print and online access for $125. Which would you choose? Dan Ariely did this exact experiment and found that 16% of his students chose the first option, nobody chose the second option, and 84% chose the third option. When Ariely got rid of the second option, 68% of the participants chose the first option and 32% chose the third option. Why? Well, because the second option was acting as an anchor and represented a certain value that made the third option more appealing when it was present. If I can just get the print version for $125, why wouldn't I get the print and online version for the same price? See what I mean? Okay, great. So basically what we've learned so far is that heuristics are used both online and offline to help guide our decisions. Therefore, our story so far is that the internet doesn't really change our judgment and decision making, but instead we use heuristics that we already use in the real world to guide our choices on the web. However, I have done a lot of research and have found some information that could prove that to not be entirely true. My first example involves a psychological phenomenon called the mere exposure effect. The mere exposure effect is when people tend to like things after they have been exposed to those things multiple times. According to Stanford University professor R.B. Zajunk's paper, mere exposure, a gateway to the subliminal, exposure effects are more pronounced when obtained under subliminal conditions 
reactions than when subjects are aware of their repeated exposures. This indicates that when people don't realize they're being exposed to something frequently, they are more likely to like it. You can see this effect in your everyday life. The same songs keep playing on the radio, brand logos are on t-shirts, product placements are on TV shows, and so on. However, there is reason to believe that the mere exposure effect is becoming more prevalent with advertising and marketing during the internet age. With social media, people can follow their favorite brands and get updates from them. This gives companies access to a place where people spend a lot of their online lives. News feeds. So when you're scrolling through your friends' posts, you might not realize it, but you might pass a post by Nike talking about their new shoes. Next time you're buying shoes, you might consider buying Nikes. In fact, Nike find tremendous success in 2012 during the London Olympic Games, when they included the hashtag FindGreatness in all their marketing material. They managed to get 16,020 tweets associated with the words Nike and Olympics during the Olympic Games and increased their Twitter following by 11%. They also saw their revenues increase 12% in the fourth quarter of that year. This shows the power of the mere exposure effect, especially when you consider Adidas, a rival of Nike, only got 9,300 tweets during that same time when they didn't focus as much on Twitter. Social media is a game changer when it comes to brands we decide to buy from in the internet age. With the mere exposure effect, it's the brands that have the bigger social media presences that eventually win our wallets. Next I want to talk about our decisions regarding our new dating habits, specifically online dating. While there are many types of dating sites and apps out there, I'm going to focus on Tinder because it is rather popular among college students and young adults. For those of you who don't know, Tinder is an app where you're given a bunch of people's profiles that look like cards and you swipe right if you like what you see and swipe left if you don't. If two people swipe right on each other, then they're a match and can message each other. Janet Purvis wrote in her article, A Social Psychologist Explains Why Tinder is So Evilly Satisfying, that when it comes to finding a mate, Tinder's rapid pace appeals to the simplest of our cognitive shortcuts. Are they nearby? Are they available? Are they attractive? If so, swipe right. While Tinder is not necessarily changing who we want to date, it is definitely changing the way we decide who to date. With all this information readily available, we can find a potential loved one more efficiently than ever before. And before you say, Tinder? Oh come on, people just use that for hookups. Take note of a study done by Cindy Sumter, Laura Vandenbosch, and Lois Ligtenberg. They conducted an online survey among Dutch users between the ages of 18 and 30 and found that finding love was a larger motivator for using Tinder than finding a hookup. Furthermore, they found that 45.5% of participants went on a date after matching with someone on Tinder, and only 18% of respondents had a one-night stand after matching with someone on Tinder. So clearly more people are using Tinder to find love, and they're using it because it's similar to how we find partners in real life but turbocharged. In a matter of fact, Thomas Chamorro Pramuzic of the University College London stated that Tinder is an extension of mainstream real-world dating habits and that people would rather judge 50 pictures in two minutes than spend 50 minutes assessing one potential partner. Tinder is changing the way we decide who to date by making things more accessible. Never before have we had the opportunity to find partners with this kind of efficiency, and it's just getting started. Humans are taking advantage of this opportunity and it's changing the dating world forever. The last example I'd like to discuss is internet trolling. We all know what it is and we've especially seen it in YouTube comments. What leads people to act this way? Certainly people don't act this way in real life, right? Turns out there is this thing called the online disinhibition effect, popularized from the work of John Seller. The online disinhibition effect is when someone feels like a completely new person online. They don't feel like any actions they do online will ever harm them in real life, so they feel sort of invincible. This is a relatively new phenomenon, as the internet itself is rather new, and is leading people to choose to act in nasty ways when they wouldn't normally in the real world. It's important to note here that this effect only really occurs when individuals can remain anonymous. In a study conducted by Michelle Wright, she found that when participants were not anonymous on social media sites, there was a significant reduction in trolling. However, those persistent enough to want to continue trolling proceeded to create fake accounts. Another study conducted by Noam Lapidot Leffler and AZ Eric concluded that the lack of eye contact in online interactions may be a factor in why trolls are hateful. They found that increased eye contact tended to inhibit online disinhibition. This makes sense because as Pam Ramson of the University of Bradford noted, eye contact increases self-awareness, empathy, and awareness of other people's reactions to what is being discussed. Without eye contact, you're essentially talking to a wall. This lack of eye contact and increased anonymity provided by the internet is leading people to choose more harmful lifestyles by hurting others online. While there may never be a concrete solution to preventing online trolls, Trolls, it is a step to see how their choices to troll are made. Maybe policymakers and programmers in the future can create systems where it makes it harder for people who decide to troll to do it in the first place. Regardless, this is a good example of how the internet has changed some people's choices for the worst. So, as you can see, our lives have been drastically changed by the internet. In some ways, the internet has just become an extension of behaviors we already do without the internet, like the heuristics we talked about before. And in other ways, the internet has slightly changed, or in some cases created, judgment and decision-making behaviors, such as with buying from brands who use social media, 
using dating apps to find partners, and online trolling. It will be interesting to see how emerging technologies will continue to change the way we make decisions and redefine what it means to make choices as a human being. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.